Hey guys, Blame on George here. Similar to my Lost Media Case File series, I often come across smaller mysteries that I can't really dedicate a full video to. They're still pretty interesting, and I want to talk about them. So today, I thought I'd compile some of them together. Let me know if you like this format in the comments down below, as well as your thoughts on these mini-mysteries. But without further ado, let's talk about a missing woman who might not exist, some missing money, and the missing identity of a renegade TV broadcaster. On January 14, 1989, NBC-owned Chicago television channel WMAQ aired an image of a missing woman after some pretty standard programming. In the lineup leading to the image, there was generic segments and public service announcements, covering illegal drugs, medical bracelets, meditation, and more. As was standard, the channel then signed off for the night with a quick closing comment, followed by the U.S. National Anthem. As the camera panned to the US flag and zoomed in, the image abruptly cut. Revealing a strange, overexposed photograph of a missing female by the name Joanna Lopez. Below, it said, Call 312-744-5594. All pretty normal, right? Well, not really. Supposedly, the image of Joanna Lopez stayed on screen for several hours, until the very next morning, when the channel resumed for the following day's programming. For the entirety of its duration, the creepy image was accompanied by nothing but near silence and the crackle of static. There was no voiceover offering details about Joanna, and no further explanation or exposition. There were no details about her age, her height, her supposed whereabouts, or even where she might have been from. If someone was looking for Joanna, they weren't looking very hard. That is until 1991, when they tried once more. This concludes another day of outstanding television programming on WMAQ-TV, Channel 5, NBC in Chicago. In 1991, the exact same TV channel used the exact same image of Joanna Lopez, affixed to the end of another standard sign-off. Again, the U.S. National Anthem played, and just like before, the camera panned to the U.S. flag before zooming in. Once more, it abruptly cut to the same image of Joanna Lopez. This time, though the image was exactly the same, the resolution was a little higher, making some of the woman's features slightly easier to pick out. Again, the image was accompanied by the same exact text, but with no further information. On this second occasion, the unusual image remained on screen for around 10 seconds, before cutting to colored bars and a high-pitched tone. And then, nothing. Apart from these two pieces of video footage, there's absolutely no other record of a missing person by the name Joanna Lopez. The Charlie Project has no record of a Joanna Lopez ever going missing. And there are no newspaper articles about the woman, her disappearance, or her identity. In short, no one seems to know who this woman is, who she was, or if she's even real. But surely, she must be real, right? Or else, 
why would the information have been televised? And why would it have been given the go-ahead from whoever was operating WMAQ? A missing person's poster doesn't appear on TV by accident. And it definitely doesn't appear by accident on two separate occasions, two years apart. If Joanna Lopez was a real person, and if she was really missing, why was there such a low effort attempt to find her? Her image was posted at least twice on a local TV station, but that's all. And why was the image of such low quality? Perhaps it was a photocopy of a missing person's poster, but if it was, and if the police knew any of her relatives, friends, or connections, why couldn't they have obtained a better photograph? Some claim that Joanna was perhaps a missing child who escaped from care. The phone number listed on the TV poster is no longer valid, but it did once belong to the Chicago Police Department Youth Division. So this seems like the most logical theory. Others have speculated that the case might have been a hoax, or some bizarre early form of an ARG, which never led anywhere. Others think it might have been a strange prank, and that Joanna Lopez was just a made-up name, concocted by someone working at WMAQ. Some speculate that she might have changed her name at some point in her life, and that's why no records of her disappearance exist. There is one potential, but relatively unlikely, explanation. When the Joanna Lopez mystery was explored on Reddit, a couple of Redditors took their investigations to the Doe Network an online voluntary organization who explored cold cases across the world. Some users found a Jane Doe that could be a potential match for Joanna Lopez. The post says, quote, I spent some time on the Doe network this morning and came across a Jane Doe who died in the Chicago area in 1994, who I suspected may be Joanna, but am uncertain. I will link her page below. Also, if anyone has any information, please share, comment, and contact anyone who could help. It'd be horrible to think that somebody could just slip through the cracks and be lost a time like that. This woman, whose real name is unknown, was found dead in Chicago, Illinois, on May 24th, 1994. She was discovered in an alley, naked from the waist down, except for one sock. Investigators estimated that she was between 18 and 22 years of age, and that she died within 24 hours of her body's discovery. Her killer claimed that he'd picked her up while she was working as a prostitute. Neither he nor investigators knew her name, and no one has been able to identify who this woman was, or if she really is Joanna Lopez. From the images and description of the woman and her whereabouts, there's a small chance she's a match. But because the photograph used in the WMAQ broadcast was so vague, it's very difficult to be sure. Some Redditors followed these investigations up by contacting officials and authorities, but none of the inquiries led them anywhere, and they came no closer to uncovering the truth. No matter who Joanna Lopez was, or where Joanna Lopez really went. She's certainly not alone. In the USA, an estimated 600,000 people go missing every year, and many of them are never found. In 1963, Frank Sinatra's son was kidnapped. John Foss, young Sinatra's trumpet-playing roommate, says two gunmen left him bound and gagged when they took the young singer off into a snowstorm Sunday night. Since he was taken from this hotel room, there has been no word either from Frank Sinatra Jr. or his abductors. There are growing fears for his life. His manager, Tino Barzi, as official contact, waits for the call that hasn't come yet. 
Frank Sinatra Jr. was 19 years old at the time and was taken from his Lake Tahoe hotel room in Nevada. Shortly after, the three kidnappers contacted Frank Sinatra Sr., demanding a hefty ransom. Barry Keenan, Joe Amsler, and Johnny Irwin wanted $240,000 for the safe return of Sinatra's son, a sum now equivalent to around $2 million. Sinatra paid the money as instructed, and his son was released as promised. But only around two-thirds of the cash was ever recovered. So what happened to the rest? Why was it never found? Was it used to make one of the kidnappers a multimillionaire? Or might its disappearance be a clue that the whole thing was a huge scam? On December 8, 1963, 23-year-old kidnappers Barry Keenan and Joe Amsler entered Frank Sinatra Jr.'s hotel room, pretending to be a pair of delivery men. Holding him at gunpoint, they led him out of the room before driving him to a house in Los Angeles. They kept Frank Sinatra Jr. in this house for four days, while negotiating with his father, one of the most famous men of all time. You see, after a car accident that left Barry Keenan with chronic back pain, bankruptcy, and an expensive prescription drug addiction, he was desperate to make some big money and invested to secure his future. And this kidnapping plot was how he intended to get it. In the weeks leading up to the kidnapping, Keenan and Amsler had followed Frank Sinatra Jr. from city to city, tracking his moves in an attempt to find the perfect moment to pounce. And in Lake Tahoe, that's exactly what they did. After nabbing Sinatra's son, the kidnappers demanded that all business be conducted via payphone, and insisted that Sinatra Jr. wouldn't be returned until his father handed over the cash. Frank Sinatra Sr., of course, wanted to secure the release of his son, so he played by the kidnappers' rules. But before the cash was handed over, he gave it to the FBI, who photographed every note. They hoped that by keeping track of every serial number, they could eventually hunt down the kidnappers by following the whereabouts of the money. Keenan's mother's ex-boyfriend, John Irwin, was the middleman in the case. He was responsible for passing messages between Sinatra and the two younger men who'd kidnapped his son. But while the money was being picked up by Keenan and Amsler, Irwin got nervous, releasing Sinatra Jr and telling his own brother about what he'd done. So swiftly, the three conspirators were tracked down, along with most of the ransom money. But this is where things become pretty bizarre. Only $168,000 was ever recovered. So what happened to the rest? Barry Keenan, who masterminded the whole plot, was released after serving only four and a half years on his term, despite receiving a 75-year sentence. Courts declared that he was legally insane at the time of the crime, and could therefore be released without any further consequences. His defense team claimed that Keenan could hear voices in his head, who convinced him his plan had been devised and graced by God. Similarly, Amsler and Irwin served only three and a half years each. But these very short sentences made a lot of people suspicious. Why did the mastermind of a high-profile kidnapping plot serve less than 10% of his time? Is it possible that the police were in on the plot, and that they too profited from the ransom money? Or did the Sinatras orchestrate the plan as part of some strange publicity stunts? It's well known that Frank Sinatra knew lots of shady mafiosos. But after the three kidnappers were released from prison, none of them ever encountered any trouble. If the Sinatras were capable of revenge, why was none ever handed out? Strangely, after Keenan and Amster had kidnapped Sinatra Jr., they drove past a police roadblock. Authorities knew that Frank Sinatra Jr. had been kidnapped and were actively looking for the singer's son. So they stopped the kidnappers to quiz them. But Keenan, 
talked his way out of it. If the police knew that Frank Sinatra Jr. was kidnapped, and they knew what he looked like, how is this possible? During trial, Keenan and his team maintained that the whole case was nothing but a publicity stunt, orchestrated and managed by the Sinatra family. And lots of people still believe this, claiming that the police kept some of the ransom money for their part in the plot. Others think there's a much simpler explanation for the missing money. According to these theorists, it's much more likely that Keenan simply hid his share of the cash before recovering it upon his early release. After he was freed from prison, Barry Keenan went on to invest money into real estate and become a multi-millionaire. So perhaps he did just hide his money before spending it many years later. Whatever the case, Keenan doesn't seem to have much regret. In a 1998 interview, he said, quote, I decided upon Junior because Frank Sinatra Sr. was tough, and I had friends whose parents were in the show business, and I knew Frank always got his way. It wouldn't be morally wrong to put him through a few hours of grief worrying about his son, unquote. And Frank Sinatra Sr. did go through grief, because all kidnapping negotiations were undertaken via payphone, Sinatra became concerned that he wouldn't have enough money to fund the calls. So for the entire ordeal, he always kept 10 dimes in his pocket. And as a man of superstition, he maintained this habit for the rest of his life. From 1963 onwards, Frank Sinatra Sr. always carried a roll of 10 dimes. And by the time he died in 1998, he was so well known for doing this that he was buried with 10 dimes in his pocket. You've all heard about the infamous Max Headroom hijacking, in which two Chicago TV stations were briefly hacked by a mysterious figure wearing a Max Headroom costume. But this is an even stranger TV piracy enigma that's never been solved. It's a strange case that isn't really well known. On April 14th, 1978, the first ever US-based pirate TV station was launched, known as Lucky 7 screening 25 hours of content from April 14th to April 16th. No footage of the station exists, but there are several reports of the really weird content it contained. Airing from Syracuse, New York, and apparently seen by up to half of the region's viewers, no one ever worked out who was behind the Lucky 7 channel, or what their intentions were. Some of the stuff they screened was bizarre, while some was pretty mundane. But it was an odd and unusual three-day collection of content. All of it was broadcast over VHF Channel 7, a then unused frequency accessed and exploited by the mysterious Lucky 7 channel. Some of the content was relatively innocuous, including episodes of Star Trek and The Twilight Zone. Other screenings included movies that weren't yet available on broadcast TV, including Rocky, and One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. But it wasn't all so innocent. The temporary channel also aired notorious hardcore porno movies Behind the Green Door and Deep Throat. This was the first time Deep Throat had ever been seen on broadcast television. In between screenings of the various TV shows and movies, a strange man would sometimes appear on screen, wearing a gas mask and, according to some reports, a noose around his neck. This mysterious man often commented on the channel, its content, and its viewers. At one point, he told watchers, quote, 
Lucky 7 reaches about half of the Syracuse area. If you're watching, you're part of that half. Unquote. Strangely, the Lucky 7 production values were pretty good. The channel had its own animated logo, a pair of dice rolling to a 7, along with a catchy jingle made up of female singing voices. At the time, authorities were determined to catch the face behind the channel, telling the New York Times, quote, We are interested in finding out who is broadcasting that stuff. In the same interview, authorities added that the crime was punishable by fines of up to $10,000, one year in jail, or both. Despite their attempts, investigators couldn't track down who was behind the Lucky 7 channel, despite some vague clues and suspicions. In the years that followed, speculation has continued, and many people believe they might know who was behind the hijacking. Because it's such a mysterious case, and because no footage remains, there are endless theories about Lucky 7. Some people claim to know the person behind the channel, and that it was someone who still works in the TV industry. In 2009, a forum user on radiodiscussions.com claimed, quote, the real stations did stories on Lucky 7. I know one station that still has its archives from back then. I bet they have it on tape. I had heard they actually built a VHF transmitter. I don't mean to be arrogant, but I know who did it, but I dare not say. The brains of the organization went on to put a TV station on the air in a northeast Pennsylvania city, put it that way. When I worked at Channel 3 slash WSTM in the early 90s, I mentioned the man's name and Lucky 7 to then Assistant Chief Engineer Gary Hartman. This is a man who never got mad, never swore. Suddenly, his face turned be red. He stiffened up and said, that son of a bitch stole parts from us to build that. Nine years later, another user in the same thread agreed. Posting, quote, I suspect most of us in the business in the area know who is behind it. It's been long enough that it's not much of a secret anymore. Perhaps someday he'll share the details of the story with all of us. Others don't believe such a big name was behind the broadcast, and instead claim that it might have been a student at Syracuse University, where lots of people study both TV and radio. Word has it that it was the brainchild of some Syracuse University communication students who used some equipment, normally used for a closed circuit broadcast on Channel 7, and simply found the necessary means to amplify the signal and send it on its merry way via a makeshift antenna cut for Channel 7. Since Syracuse U is a well-known communication school with a big radio and TV production facility, well, you get the idea. Perhaps some of the enigmatic Lucky 7 footage might one day emerge. Even better, perhaps the world might one day track down the face behind the channel, or rather the face behind the gas mask. If some people really do know who it is, maybe it's just a matter of time until they reveal themselves. We'll just have to wait and see. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Take care.